<laughs> um, I want to again welcome you, especially if you're new to the Health Conservancy. Um, we are, of course, appropriately tonight going to be talking about snow, um, something that we already have a lot of and apparently might be getting more of this week. Um, again, for those of you who I have not yet met, my name is Sarah Brooks and I am the Associate Director here at the Met Health Conservancy. And we are a nonprofit land trust and community conservation organization seeking to inspire people to care for the land of the Met Health Valley. One of the ways we do that is by providing free and engaging opportunities for people to come together, even if virtually, um, to learn more about this amazing place. Um, because we do believe that the more you know, the more you care. And um, if you're new to us tonight, welcome and thank you for joining us. And of course, feel free to learn more about us and what we do and why we do it on our website at www.methowconservancy.org. Um, before we dive in and I introduce our speaker, it's really important for us to acknowledge that the Methow Conservancy as a land trust and an environmental education organization seeks to protect and steward the land that for time immemorial has been cared for by members of the Methow tribe. This is their homeland. We recognize we must do more to build better relationships and acknowledge our past with our Methow tribal descendants who still live and care for the land in this valley. One way we can honor the Methow people um, is to pay attention and to hold reverence for and to recognize our human role in the ecology of the Methow Valley. And we're excited to do a little bit of that tonight as we discuss something that I know is near and dear to many of you, snow. So tonight I'm honored to introduce uh, our speaker, Professor David Foster Hill, who is a professor at Oregon State University and a National Geographic Explorer and a member of the Science Alliance for Protect Our Winters. For over 25 years, he has been studying how water behaves in all environments from snowy peaks to coastal ecosystems. David currently co-leads the NASA funded Community Snow Observations Project the Community Snow Observations Project uh, encourages the general public, which can include all of us in the Zoom room tonight, to share snowpack data in real time when you're out having fun in the snow, skiing, snowmobiling, or snowshoeing across the landscape. According to David, you can find him on skis, no matter the hemisphere, out sampling snow. David and his family spend a lot of time in the Methow Valley, and so David is familiar with the snowy um, landscapes that we all love here. I happen to know, David and I were talking earlier, that he was just recently out enjoying the rendezvous huts here in Winthrop over the holiday break. And so we can get his perspectives on that treasure here in our community too. Um, and without further ado, David, we'll turn it over to you. And um, thank you very much for joining us. Hey, uh, thanks very much. Let me uh, see if I can successfully do this here. Looks good. We all good? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much and good evening. Um, it's great to speak with you again. Um, I am actually presently coming to you from Oregon, but I just got back from a week-long trip to Mazama and Winthrop. Um, it's very strange to be back to double digit temperatures here and rain after all the holiday cold up there. Um, so I spoke to Methow Conservancy three years ago in person at the Merck and Twist. Um, it's nice, uh, of course, it'd be nice to do it in person, but um, it's nice to be able to have a larger audience by having this be remote. So thank you very much for joining me. Um, so uh, basically, I'm going to be speaking about regional scale trends in snow and also about new real time modeling of snow distribution that we're doing throughout the Western United States. <clears throat> uh, let's see if I can get my slides to change. Give me a sec. There we go. Okay. Um, so before I get started, I want to first tell you what this talk is not. I'm, I'm not here to really talk at great length about the current snow season. Um, I'm here to talk about seasonal snow in general sources of snow information and long-term trends in snowpack. Um, now that said, the forecast for this season is actually pretty good. Um, model ensembles consistently are predicting La Nina conditions to continue throughout much of the winter. And to kind of orient you to this figure, uh, you're basically looking at sea on the vertical axis, sea surface temperature departures from normal 
for a particular patch of the ocean shown at lower right. So if temperatures run cold, it's a La Nina year. If they run warm, it's an El Nino year. Now the black line that you see to the left is showing you observations, all right? And it's below, you can see it's down around negative one degree right now. Um, and at the right, the spread of colored lines, these are showing you model simulations of the next four or five months. And they are again, below zero, which is great. So uh, for context, the Climate Prediction Center at the National Weather Service, they issue a watch if conditions are favorable for development within the next six months. They issue what's called an advisory if conditions are observed and expected to continue. Uh, there is no warning or any sort of higher level status. And now the current status is at the advisory level. So La Nina conditions are definitely here. Um, <clears throat> How that translates to snow is a really good question. So what I'm showing you here is the long-term average in black. This is a long-term average of the snow water equivalent at the Hearts Pass snow tell site. That's the black line. On top of, and you can sort of see the snowpack, of course, builds and then drops off later in the season. We'll talk more about that a bit later. Um, on top of that, the various colored lines that you see, I'm plotting snow tail curves for individual years from the moderate and strong La Nina years. Okay, and you can see that they're almost all above average. So that's a compelling result and that it shows that La Nina years in the Methow area are definitely consistently at or above mean snow conditions. So those are great odds. <clears throat> so, but let's get away from the ocean and let's get back to talking about seasonal snow a bit. So, to gain information about snow, we can do three things. We can measure it directly, we can remotely sense it, or we can use models to estimate snow in areas where we don't have measurements. All right, so these are the sort of the three legs of the stool, if you will. And the properties of snow that we're most interested in are usually snow depth, snow water equivalent, or SWE, or vertical structure of the snowpack, which can be important um, for avalanche forecasting. Now, water equivalent or weight measurements are most commonly done in situ. In other words, you go out in the field and you do it. The remote sensing of water equivalent via satellites is a developing field and it's making great progress. But in the meantime, SWE is still usually measured with coring devices, such as you see here, which is called a federal sampler. And these devices allow you to simultaneously measure the depth of the snowpack and the weight of the snowpack, which essentially allows you to get the density or the water content. So now I showed my kids a much slower version of this, okay, up at Heifer Hut just a couple of days ago, all right? And we basically got eight centimeters out of water out of this 38 centimeter deep pot. That worked out to a snow density of about 20%, which is pretty, pretty much the, the norm for this area this time of year. Um, I made a small bet with my kids. There was no money involved, but uh, asked them what they thought the snow density was gonna be. They're Oregon kids, they're used to wet cascade snow, so they were saying more like 40 or 50%, which is kind of what we get down here. So you guys are lucky in the sense that you have the dry stuff up there. So water equivalent can also be measured with automated snow pillows, all right? I mentioned the Hearts Pass snow tell site. This is a picture of a different snow tell site. Snow, pi snow pillows use a fluid filled bladder which is on the ground there to measure pressure essentially and therefore the weight of the snowpack lying above. Um, the SWE curves that we looked at a moment ago come from these types of instruments. Now, depth measurements are much easier by comparison. It doesn't take any fancy equipment, it doesn't take anything expensive, you just need a meter stick or an avalanche probe or a tape measure or any combination of those things. Go out, stick it in the snow, sample in a few spots, make sure you're not hitting a rock or a buried log, average the results and, and call it good. It's that easy to measure snow depth. Now, there are several different citizen science programs that are out there that collect depth measurements. Uh, one is called COCORAS, um, and this has a very large network of sort of backyard observers who regularly measure rain and snow in their backyard, or a lot of school programs will do this on the school grounds. And the COCORAS website allows for really nice visual exploration of the data, uh, both in space and in time. Now the Community Snow Observations Project, which I spoke about three years ago, actually, we obtained snow depth primarily from backcountry snow enthusiasts, and then also backcountry professionals, such as AVI forecasters, ski patrollers, and so on. Um, these data are particularly valuable because they come from high elevation areas of complex mountain terrain. 
And these areas are the most challenging to model, so we need the most help there. And they also hold the most snow, so they're really the most interesting. And since its beginning, the CSO project has collected several tens of thousands of data points from several thousand individual users. So we're really happy with how it's going. Now, remote measurements of depth are possible, okay, in, in addition to measuring them in situ with a meter stick. And they're really fantastic. They can be made from a fixed platform like an instrument tower. They can be made from a mobile platform like a plane or a satellite or a drone. And the way it works is that the distance between the platform and the bare ground is going to be a known quantity based upon direct measurements or high accuracy GPS information. The distance between the platform and the snow surface is measured. And this is done essentially by timing how long it takes a signal like laser light or, or sound waves to bounce off of the snow surface and then return back to the instrument. So that gives you the red arrow in this diagram. Subtraction then simply gives you the depth of the snowpack. Now for a fixed platform, these measurements can be re repeated continuously to create a time series of snow depth. And for a moving platform like a plane, or a drone, consecutive measurements over time basically get stitched together to provide you a really nice high density spatial map of snow depth. Now, programs like NASA's Airborne Snow Observatory or the SNOW experiment or SNOW-X, they use airplanes to repeated, repeatedly map selected domains. And this is fantastic. It's very expensive though, so it's usually only done once a month or a few times per season. And at the right, the very recent ICESat-2 satellite provides global measurements of elevation. Now, ICESat-2 is focused primarily on polar applications, but it does give some coverage at mid-latitudes. So it has really great potential to provide additional information on snow cover. Now, finally, there are other satellite assets out there that provide visual images of snow cover, not depth in this case, just snow cover. Um, on the left, this is an image from the Sentinel satellite, which is operated by the European Space Agency. And this is showing you snow cover in the Mount Cook area of New Zealand. On the right, this is a reconstruction of snow cover from the MODIS sensor, which is carried by the Terra and the Aqua satellites. And you can see the very impressive snow cover over much of North America. This is not today, this is a, a, a historical photo. Okay, so we talked about measuring things directly. We talked about snow model, I'm sorry, we talked about measuring things remotely. Finally, snow models help to fill the gaps in space and time between other measurements. And there's a lot to like about this. Okay, computers are fast, they don't mind working overtime, they don't get cold toes out in the field, so they're the perfect partner. Um, this is a sample image of SWE as estimated by what is called the Snow Data Assimilation System or SNOWDAS. Now, SNODAS pro products are available for the entire United States, except Alaska, um, at a one kilometer spatial scale. So that's relatively coarse. Think of a checkerboard with one kilometer squares and at a daily time step. At a much higher resolution, the CSO project, the Community Snow Observation Project, we have just recently started doing real-time modeling and we use model grids, which are much, much higher resolution, like 25 to 75 meters or so. And we make this information available at mountainsnow whoops, at mountainsnow.org. Okay, and I'll talk a bit more about this a little bit later in the talk. Okay, so that's a quick tour of snow information, and there's actually a lot out there. Um, if we're interested in making use of that information to sort of investigate changes. Um, the most important thing to consider right off the bat is over what time scale, all right? That's a hugely important question. So on one hand, we can have very significant changes in snow from one year to the next, and this is what's known as interannual variability. Just because last year's snowpack may have been amazing doesn't mean that this year's snowpack is going to be, all right? At longer time scales, we can have underlying oscillations, such as the ENSO oscillation, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Southern Oscillation. And this leads to changes in the snowpack at time scales of roughly like five to 10 years or so. At even longer time scales, all right, say a few decades, we can potentially have changes in some variable, variable of interest. The snow might be growing in some area over the past 30 or 40 years. It might be decreasing. 
So this need for long-term data sets to identify long-term changes in snow, this is really important because this determines which data sets we are essentially able to use for doing this kind of analysis. Now, in the Western US, we are amazingly well situated right, in this regard. The Natural Resources Conservation Service, or the NRCS, they maintain a very large network of snow telemetry sites, about seven to 800. And these snow tell sites continuously monitor, monitor snow depth, snow water equivalent, and other variables. Snow tell sites have varying periods of record, um, but many of them came online close to about 1980. So we have a pretty robust data set of about 40 years for most of these snow tell sites. Um, now, the NRCS website, which I totally encourage you to go look at later, just Google NRCS Snow Telemetry and you'll find it. And they have really amazing tools that will allow, allow you to visualize the snow and how it compares to long-term averages. So now back at, the, back at the beginning of December, okay, everything was very dire and people were basically freaking out over much of the Western United States that there, there was no snow. And you can see that in this picture on the left. Basically anything that is orange or red is showing you a watershed that where the snow water equivalent is much less than average, okay? Um, and so people were right, there was no snow in the Western United States at the beginning of December, but the correlation between early season snow and late season snow is really very weak, all right? So you really have to just be patient. And one month later, here we are. Okay, California is basically buried. Oregon is basically buried. The roads east of us are completely closed and we don't know when they're going to open again. Okay, so things can change really quickly. <clears throat> now, there's also a very large, what is called snow course network, which is maintained by the NRCS. Now a snow course is a location where the snow depth and water equivalent are measured manually, all right? Measurements are typically made once per month during the snow season. And there's actually a measurement site right near the Bush schools, as best I can tell from this figure, um, just northwest of Mazama, a mile or so. Now, snow core sites have much longer periods of record than snow tell sites. Some of them go back over 100 years, which is an amazing resource for doing long-term studies of change. Okay, in addition to these snow core sites, there are still other sources of snow data that you should be aware of. Uh, many states have their own snow survey programs. California is a great example. Uh, many state departments of transportation do a good job of collecting snow information, typically at the passes. Um, avalanche centers collect a lot of snow information. So in Washington, NWAC is fantastic. They have an absolutely amazing network of snow depth sensors and other sort of weather information, if you've not explored that yet. That said, for long-term trends, if we wanna look at stuff over the past 30, 40, 50 years, the NRCS data sort of still remain the gold standard for analyzing change. Okay, so we've got an idea of what kind of snow information's out there. We've got an idea of what might be the best source. Next question is, well, what exactly do we look at? All right, what matters most in terms of quantifying snow? So this is kind of my cartoon sketch of a SWE curve showing an accumulation phase at left and then a steeper, what is called abl ablation or melt phase at the right, all right? And this is very common. Snow builds until typically April 1st and then it drops off a cliff. So the vast majority of studies of snow and snow changes that are out there have focused on the April 1st value. Okay, why? Well, remember, first of all, snow courses typically have only monthly data, and it's typically at the beginning of the month. So we only have so many data points to choose from, and April tends to have the maximum value. So traditionally, the April 1st snow measurement is kind of the, the thing that people look at the most. Um, and if you want to talk about dismal snow years, okay, this is a great example. This is from April 1st, 2015 at Echo Summit, California. And so this is the place where they sort of traditionally look at the snowpack and they, they use that to kind of estimate the, the water yield that they're going to have for agriculture and municipal use. And this snowpack is about as sad as the expression on then Governor Jerry Brown's face in the middle of the photo there, okay? But that said, most of the time, April 1st is great and that means deep snow. <clears throat> But the thing is, is that the April 1st snow doesn't tell the full story, all right? So this is where I want to start talking about how things might change. 
So let's imagine that something happens climatically to simply shift the snow season backwards or forwards a few weeks. So that's what I'm showing you with the dotted line here. Well, the snow that you measure on April 1st would be less, but is there really a true change in the snow for all practical purposes? I would argue that no, there's not. There's the same amount of snow there, it's just been shifted in time. So a measure of how the snow is distributed over the snow season might be valuable rather than just a single data point, the April 1st data point. So something else we could do is we could, we could consider the number, of snow, the number of snow covered days as a useful metric. Okay, now this is not something that can be computed for snow courses because snow courses only have four or five measurements, okay, over the course of the year. And we don't have the temporal, temporal resolution to nail down how many days there was snow on the ground. So there are far fewer studies out there of changes in snow covered days, but there are some. Now, if the shape of the SWE curve, and by shape, I'm simply referring to the geometry of this triangle. If the shape of the SWE curve never changed, then the maximum snow, the height of the triangle, and the snow covered days, the base of the triangle, that would tell you everything that you need to know in terms of changes. But it gets, the story gets more complicated because in some areas, snowpack is becoming more intermittent with numerous episodes of kind of rain on snow causing significant melt in advance of the April 1st peak or simply warming might be causing that. So a few years ago, uh, Keith Musselman and some other authors introduced the idea of what's called a melt fraction, all right, to quantify this. What this melt fraction is, is it's defined as the percent of total melt that occurs before April 1st. Now, if you look at that purple line, if you look at that triangle, that sweet curve has a melt fraction of 0% because all of the melt occurs April, after April 1st. On the other hand, the orange line that has the zigzags going up and down, that probably has a melt fraction of about 50% or so, because there's a lot of melt going on before April 1st. Okay, so this is another way of looking at the snow. But even melt fraction might not be the best, most complete measure of the true value of snow. Okay, the true value of snow includes things like, well, it reduces flooding. It provides ecosystem services. It provides recreational services. In this figure that you see here, the purple and the orange SWE curves have very different melt fraction values, like I mentioned on the previous slide. But if you look at them, they seem to sort of more or less have the same amount of snow being stored throughout the season. So my research group has kind of proposed that people start considering as the best metric for snow information is what we call the snow storage or the area under the curve. And that's kind of the green hatch marks that you see there. So we might have some crazy snow year where we get some early snow, it goes away. We get some more, it goes away. We don't have any snow for a while. And then we have that late season snow. And so by simply adding up the area underneath that curve, it gives us this integrated over time view of how much snow was stored during a particular season. Okay, so with all of this, discussion of, of sort of different types of change. What I'd like to do now is to sort of zoom, zoom in a little bit on the Pacific Northwest and look at some of the changes in snow in recent times. So to do that, I wanna start off with the major inputs to snow. Okay, so you know many people are probably familiar with these kinds of figures. What I'm showing you here on the left is I'm basically showing you winter precipitation. Okay, so this is essentially December, January, February averaged over 1980 to 2010. So it's a 30 year average, right? And you see, of course, the, the significant rain on the coast and over the Cascades and then the Eastern uh, parts of both Oregon and Washington being very dry. At right, this is essentially average winter temperature. All right, and we see the warmer temperatures near the coast and so on and so forth. All right, so this is very, very, very uh, well understood. We have these kind of maritime climates near the coast. We have these more continental, continental climates inland. So it's the combination of the wet and cold, of course, that give us the snow patterns that we see in the Pacific Northwest. So in this figure, what I am showing you is I am showing you, the, again, the long-term average, and this is showing you the precipitation as snow, but I'm giving it to you in terms of water equivalent. So this isn't the depth of snow that falls. This is the water equivalent of the precipitation as snow. And we clearly see sort of the, uh, 
the spine here of the Oregon Cascades, the Wallowas out here, and then the broader footprint of the Washington Cascades. So if you're curious, Washington, the state of Washington averages about 1,000 millimeters of total precipitation annually, averaged over the whole state, and about 15 to 20% of that, again, averaged over the state, uh, falls as snow. Okay, so if we want to like look at changes to snow, we got to start thinking about, well, the changes to the main drivers, right? And so we can start by looking at um, some of these long-term changes. Now, this is the figure that comes from the 2014, what's called National Climate Assessment. And what this figure is showing you is it is showing you temperatures from 1991 to 2012 compared to the 1901 to 1960 average. Okay, this is the way that the National Climate Assessment carried out this. So again, the, the overall figure that you see of the states is showing you the departure of temperature from basically 1990 to 2010 compared to the first half of the 20th century. And things are generally speaking red, indicating that uh, temperatures have gone up. In the Pacific Northwest, again, using this time frame, we are presently about 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit above the 1901 to 1960 average. Uh, this is a different look. And this is one that focuses on a particular month of interest. The previous figure was annual. So here what I'm doing is I'm taking the difference between two climatologies. Now a climatology is a 30 year average. So I'm essentially taking, these are for December temperatures. I'm taking the period of 1991 to 2020, and then I'm subtracting off the average from 1981 to 2010. So essentially it's kind of like taking the difference between two 30 year averages shifted by 10 years. So it gives you an idea of the changes in temperature for December over the past 10 years. And so you kind of zoom in on sort of north central Washington here, and it's, you know, half a degree to a degree centigrade, which is about one to two degrees Fahrenheit in about the past 10 years or so. Changes in precipitation are, are a little bit messier and a little bit less obvious. Um, you know, this is, again, this is not my figure. This comes from the National Climate Assessment. Um, and the observed increases that you are seeing in the Pacific Northwest, and by increases, I mean the green colors, um, these are a little bit biased because they are due in part to the major droughts of the 1930s and the 1950s, okay, which makes that baseline period comparatively dry. So I'd say precipitation has kind of gone up a little bit, but it's not a dramatic change, like uh, the, the more dramatic change for temperatures. And in the end, I will say this, that our snow is more sensitive to small changes in temperature than it is to small changes in precipitation. So it can be useful to think about a given year snowpack based on this simple diagram, I think, okay? So I'm kind of showing you on the horizontal axis, by, when I say precipitation percentile, I mean zero to 100%. So things over on the right basically are unbelievably wet. Things over on the left are unbelievably dry. The vertical axis is the same thing. It's the SWE percentile, again, going from a value of zero to 100. So things on the bottom would basically be not a lot of snow and things up high would be a lot of snow. All right, <clears throat> so um, up in the upper right, okay, where I have things labeled as deep, basically we're talking about a year with a lot of precipitation and a lot of snow due to cooperative temperatures. In other words, Tons of precip, it was cold, tons of snow, everyone's happy. At the lower left, what's called dry snow drought, we have a poor year driven largely by the lack of precipitation, okay? So it still may be cold and we've gotten some snow, all right, but there's just not that much precipitation. Now, lower right, this is the more interesting one, okay, known as a warm snow drought, where we may have a banner year in terms of precipitation, but, the SWE percentile is very, very low because the temperatures were high. Okay, so plenty of precip, but not enough snow. So there's really two different kinds of snow droughts to be thought about. Okay, to kind of bring it around a little bit to the punchline, how do long-term changes in precipitation and temperature show up in terms of changes to snowpack? All right, let's walk through this figure. On the left, what I've done is I have plotted about 700 snow course sites and they are colored by elevation. The, the blue colors are low elevations, the yellow colors are high, 
So you can see that we have comparatively low elevations in the Pacific Northwest compared to continental locations in the Rocky Mountains and then also the High Sierra. Over a 50 year period, okay, and these are snow course locations. So over a 50 year period, what I did is I calculated the percent change in the April 1st snowpack. Let's go to the figure on the right. If you see gray dots, those are snow course locations where maybe there was a trend, but it was not statistically significant. So I left it gray. The other symbols that you see, they are colored according to the amount of change. If you see a blue symbol, it means that the snow has been going up. If you see a kind of a pinkish or a red symbol, okay, the snow colors, the snow has been going down. <clears throat> One location in that figure on the right shows a positive change statistically significant and 224 show negative changes. Okay, the mean percentage change for stations showing a loss is roughly negative 40%. Okay, and that's not negative 40% per year, that is spread out over the 50 year, 50 year time period. Okay, so we can similarly examine snow tail stations. Now remember, these snow tail stations don't have periods of record as long as snow courses. What I've done here is I've kept about 500 stations that had 40 years of data, okay? Uh, that's a shorter time period. It means it might be a bit harder to pick up trends. So on the left, what I am doing is I'm doing the same kind of calculation for April 1st sweep, all right? Three stations show increases, 50 stations show decreases, and the mean change for stations with the loss is negative 48%. Now, let's go over to the right. I am doing the same thing, but I am now making calculations of change in that snow storage idea where we integrate the area under the SWE curve, right? And there are some interesting differences. Like if you look at Utah, we see a lot of reduction in the April 1st SWE, but we don't see very much reduction in snow storage. And this could be due to snow being on the ground for longer periods. So it's a, it's a sort of a flatter triangle, if you will, but wider. In Oregon, we have pretty minimal loss of April 1st SWE, but we have pretty significant loss of, or greater loss, I should say, of snow storage. And this could be due to a shorter snow season. So the, the, the maximum snow doesn't change, but those shoulder the shoulder seasons are starting to go away a little bit, and that gives us less snow being stored. I would say the take home message here though is for both snow tail and snow course data is that there are not a lot of blue markers in these figures. One last thing that we could do is that we could analyze historic trends in snow using model data, okay? And this, what I'm, you, what I'm showing you here are, because we, snow tail sites are only discrete points, okay, on a map. Um, if, you, if you actually make use of snow models, you can now look at snow anywhere, as long as you believe the model. So here what I'm doing is I'm considering changes in the snow storage for individual months. And I'm doing this using a product from the University of Arizona, which has a four kilometer spacing. So in winter months, we see kind of modest losses on the West Coast, not too bad, but we actually see some gains in some Rocky Mountain areas and in far Northeastern Montana and North Dakota and so forth. In a more sort of what I would call like a shoulder season month like November, that's the figure on the right. Here we, again, the oranges and reds and yellows are kind of unfortunate colors. That means that we basically are losing snow at those times. Okay, so that shoulder season is kind of getting eroded away a little bit. Okay, so that's all looking backwards. What about looking forward, right? For us to estimate what is most likely to happen with future snow, we have to use computer models. There is no data, okay? It hasn't happened yet. Now, as soon as you start talking about uh, sort of climate models and snow models and so forth, a lot of caveats. There are many different emissions scenarios to consider, you know, optimistic scenario, pessimistic scenario, and so forth. Um, there are also different future time periods that we could model, mid-century, end of century, and then finally, there's you know, 30 or 40 or 50 different sort of global climate models out there that one could use. So we don't really want to zoom in on one particular model, but it's a good idea to sort of like take an average of a bunch of different models to try and get an idea of the variability. <clears throat> so here's just one example, okay? 
I am going to show you, this is a long range estimate for pessimistic emissions scenarios, what is called the RCP 8.5 scenario. On the left, so this is showing you the period of 2071 to 2100 compared to 1980 to 2010. And the colors are showing you the change in mean winter temperature in degrees centigrade. Uh, and there's a lot of red and orange there. Okay, so this is not unexpected. Um, basically, broad based increases in temperature are expected. The figure on the right, this is showing you a change in winter precipitation, not snow, winter precipitation. Okay, and we actually see in the Pacific Northwest some predictions that winter precipitation is going to go up. So there's some good news and there's some bad news. More precipitation sounds great, but if it's warmer, it might be more rain than snow, which wouldn't be so great. <clears throat> so when we combine those pieces of information, we can now look at sort of what's the prediction for changes in snowfall for this future period. Okay, so that's what I'm, I'm plotting for you here. These are not percentages, these are, these are raw numbers. I'm showing you the change in precipitation as snow in terms of water equivalent, um, but everything is basically negative. Okay, so there really are no places where snowfall is predicted to go up. Um, it is predict, predicted to sort of go down across, across the board. <clears throat> okay. Um, one last thing I want to leave you with here, and then I'm going to sort of pivot a little bit talking about some kind of real-time snowpack modeling in, in your area. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, so this is a slightly different figure. What I'm, I, what I'm doing here is now I'm, I'm plotting as a ratio future precipitation as snow divided by current precipitation as snow. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in the Pacific Northwest, what I'm doing is I'm, I, every circle that you see, this is actually a ski area, okay? So I, I ran these calculations for the many hundreds of, of ski areas that we have in the United States. And there in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we see a lot of kind of orange to kind of salmon colored symbols. So these are like 0 0.3, 0 0.4, right? So we're, we're losing a lot of snow. Things could be worse though. If you kind of come over here to sort of the, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, the mid-Atlantic Northeast, you see a lot of symbols that are a much deeper red. And what that is basically telling you is that the amount of snow that's kind of predicted end of century is kind of like 10, 20% of what they're currently getting, okay? And then some places in the Rockies and then extreme upper Midwest like UP of Michigan and Minnesota actually are, are making out really okay. And that's because they're, they're insulated from these changes. They have such cold temperatures anyway. Okay, so um, earlier I briefly told you about how snow models can fill the gaps between observations. And I mentioned what is called the snow DAS model, which is a product from NOAA. And that covers the whole USA, but it's only at one kilometer. So mountainsnow.org, which is a, basically an outgrowth of the community snow observations project, this covers key high mountain areas, but at a much finer resolution between 25 to 75 meters or so. Now, the mountain snow product is produced by the CSO project. And what we do is we directly assimilate measurements that we get from backcountry users. And we do this in order to make better snowpack models and return that information, all right, to the general public. So I kind of want to wrap up my talk tonight by briefly telling you a little bit about how mountain snow works and showing you some samples of the information that we produce. So to participate in CSO, all you have to do is have a phone, have some way of measuring the snow depth, and send us the information. We get most of our information from what's called the Mountain Hub app. Uh, that's the little icon at the lower right. Uh, it's available on both iOS and Android, so pretty much got all the bases covered there. Uh, at the lower left, I hope you can see this figure okay. This is showing you the, the sort of the Mazama area, and every single blue dot that you see that's a measurement that we've gotten from somebody. I mean, some of these dots are mine, some of these are other people I know in the area, and we've had really good participation up in your area, which is great. And that is one of the reasons why we have started modeling the snowpack in your area. And I'll, I'll start showing you some figures of that in a moment. What do we do when we get that information? Good question. Um, 
we use these observations as a check and then as a correction on our computer models. Okay, so in this, this is just a little cartoon sketch of, of how snowpack modeling might work. The inputs, the purple boxes that you see are things like weather data, terrain information, land cover information, and so on. The outputs, the green box that you see, these are the things that we care about. Um, snow depth, snow water equivalent, you know, snow density, all that sort of stuff. When we get observations through our project, the orange box, and if they differ from what the model says, that's a problem. That tells us that we have an error in the model and we therefore build that information into our model and sort of run the model again to make it better, all right? So in a nutshell, that is what we do. Um, and we do all of this every single day using fully automated processes. And we serve the results up using a Google Earth Engine app, all right, which is built into mountainsnow.org. We presently model about nine domains across the United, oops, across the United States. Um, two of them are in Washington. If you go visit mountainsnow.org later, uh, please visit the links at upper right of that website. This will kind of get you oriented um, and explain how to use the site and so forth. So if we zoom in, I see I have a whole bunch of yellow lines all over my, I don't know what happened there, but sorry about that. I seem to have scribbled on my own slides. Um, Anyway, um, as with all things Google, okay, what you can do is you can choose between map, satellite, terrain, uh, using that box at the upper right. I sort of personally like to use the terrain feature. Um, it allows me to see what's going on really well in terms of the underlying ground. And if you hover over the layers, you can go in and you can adjust the transparency of any of the, the snow information. So you can kind of see the ground underneath it, which is nice. There's a date slider at upper left, and this is going to allow you to go from the most recent time slice that we have back to October 1st of 2020, which is when we started doing this project. Something else that you can do is you can toggle on or off other sources of snow information. So here as an example, what I'm showing you is kind of our product on the left, and then the one kilometer snow DAS model at the right which clearly has a really hard time kind of capturing the variability in the snow in uh, mountainous areas of complex terrain. There are controls that will allow you to control the, the color bar. So there are these kind of sliders that you can drag up or down and you can kind of do whatever you think you need to do to make the snowpack look the best. So this is the same model result, but I've just kind of played with the maximum value of snow in terms uh, to be able to kind of uh, make these visualizations look different. And apologies for the slides jumping ahead. I'm not sure what's happened to my presentation, but it's kind of auto advancing. So I'll, I'll, I'll fumble along as best I can here. Um, other things is that you can enable various satellite views of the snowpack, which I think is really great. So at the upper left, you have the ability to look at the most recent sentinel imagery. In the middle, this is uh, the, what's called the MODIS snow cover product. And it's a binary mask. It's either red if there's snow or it's, there's nothing if there's not. And then at lower right, you're now seeing our model result. So you have all of these different ways of looking at the snowpack to understand what's going on. And then finally, you can toggle on a layer that's going to show you the 72 hour snowfall layer. And I think this is great. This, this particular image, which is from December 14th of last month, shows regions of snow loss, but then also regions of snow accumulation in the same domain. So that information is really useful, I think, in terms of helping you to find great slopes to ski maybe, but then also for assessing avalanche hazard because you can sort of see what slopes have been really heavily loaded. All right, so I hope that you will all check out mountainsnow.org and I hope that you will contribute to it by sending in snow depth data to the CSO project. So uh, in closing, I don't claim to have all the answers, that's for sure. Um, but I will say that we are very, very fortunate in the US to have access to so much snow information. So no matter what your interest is when it comes to snow, you're gonna be able to find something that will hopefully, okay, benefit you. Um, no one source is the best, and any sort of backcountry user or just snow enthusiast should constantly be reviewing and evaluating sort of a broad portfolio of snow information as you seek to kind of educate yourself about the past, 
the present and the future, all right, of the snowpack in, in, in your area. So that's kind of what I got. I would say uh, thank you very much for your time. And as you enjoy the rest of your winter season, um, you know, stay informed, stay safe. And per, by the way, the answer is yes to all three of these, I promise. Okay, I will care. <laughs> Go check things out yourself and, and definitely get a season pass for the Methow Trails or elsewhere. So it's gonna be a good year. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. And I'm still processing all the graphs and charts. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> very, very cool. Um, does anyone have a question for Professor Hill? And if so, you can unmute yourself and ask it. Or if you're having trouble with the um, recordings, you can also type it into the chat. And I'm scanning the screen looking for people who might be trying to raise their hand. Will there be glaciers in Glacier Park at the turn of the century? Oh, geez, I don't, you know, I don't know. That, I'm not a glaciologist. I have a lot of friends who are glaciologists, and I work with a lot of people who sort of, sort of study the future of glaciers. Regina Hawk is a great person to, to talk to, and there are great people at UW and at University of Oregon, I'm sorry, uh, Portland State studying those kinds of things. You know, I, it, it, Places like British Columbia and Alaska are really, really well off just due to the sheer volume and size and depth of their glaciers. A lot of the kind of the more continental mountain areas are way more at risk just because of the much smaller size of them and things like that. You know, uh, I know it's a constant sort of discussion here in Oregon about what remaining glaciers that we have and glaciers that were presently, you know, losing in the Three Sisters area and those kinds of things. So um, I, I, I haven't looked at the, the most recent studies for, for Glacier itself, um, but I know that plenty of people are worried about that. And it's certainly at a greater, it, it, at a greater risk than these other areas like uh, South Central Alaska and those kinds of places. Other, other questions? So many screens here of people, it's awesome. <laughs> I guess I have one quick question, um, Professor Hill, which is that when you've obviously been studying this for a long time and your, your um, kind of progression of thoughts to move towards snow storage as an you know, important measure to look at, um, what other things do you pay attention to that either give you hope or cause you alarm? Like when you look at the 30 year data, is there one of those slides that you really like pause on or they're all? You know, I think they're all, I mean, they're all worrisome in the sense that it'd be nice to see a bit more blue on those figures. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, you know, the data are what the data are. And it's like, you know, out of those 800 or so sites, like I said, you know, there end up being maybe 200 that have statistically significant trends. And what did I say? The average of the loss over 50 years is something like 40%. You know, I don't know. It's, I, I, I just encourage people to like, just, you know, look objectively at the numbers and don't, you know, try to extrapolate those too far. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's kind of tempting to look at something and be like, well, it lost 50% in the past 40 years. That means it's all going to be gone in the next 40 years. You know, that is a little bit, um, pessimistic I think um, I think that all that we can do is continue to look at look at what is actually going on with the data and yes they are all going down that is unfortunate um, but I I don't lose I try not to lose sleep over thinking too far into the future to be honest yep we have a question in the chat box here about how might this data impact our river flows over time um sure so you know uh, some of the stuff, some of the things that I have worked on in Alaska, I've done, so a lot of my work five, yeah, five to 10 years ago has been based in Alaska and, and up there um, in particular, you know, so the, the, the runoff that they get in the rivers, they're really is sourced from the three areas. It, it's sourced from rainfall that runs off directly. It's, it's sourced from snow melt, which peaks in sort of May and June. And then it's sourced from ice melt 
that continues through July and August. And so you can kind of look at the contributions when we do this modeling, we can look at the contributions of each of those three flows and how do they add up to the total discharge that one might see in a river. And something that I'm super interested in is like, well, over you know, 20, 40, 60, 80 year time periods, how is that going to change? Um, and in some cases, it may end up being that, you know, the overall discharge that is going to run off may not change that much, but the timing of that discharge is likely to change very significantly. Um, you know, you can have areas which uh, are dominated by snowmelt right now. And so, you know, the, 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 those, those river hydrographs have this really strong peak in May and June, and that is very likely to change in the future. So what's going to happen is you're going to end up having sort of decreased summer flows, and you're going to have increased winter flows as we have more, more and more winter precipitation coming as rain. So kind of the overall net effect is kind of a flattening of the hydrograph. Right now, does that matter? Well, it depends. Depends on what you're interested. You know, are you are you interested in water resources? Are you interested in agriculture? Are you interested in, in ecology? You know, all of those things are impacted differently by changes in the timing of runoff. You know, if we start losing snow melt and having more stream, I'm sorry, more stream flow coming directly sourced from rain, you know, stream temperatures won't be quite as cool and those kinds of things. So there are lots of really interesting things to consider. So even though the river discharge in an annual sense may not change, um, we're going to have lots of interesting changes in terms of timing. And then and also in terms of how it's distributed, you know, because other things that people are looking at, and this is getting outside of what I work directly on, but there are plenty of people that look at like, you know, what, what's the likely future going to be in terms of precipitation, but in terms of how it's distributed. So not just looking at like annual values, but like, Frequency, like, are we going to have, we, it's possible we may end up having the same overall rainfall, but it comes in fewer, more intense, okay, episodes. And again, that has lots of interesting applications. You know, if you're looking at rainfall on landscapes that have been uh, burned, you can have different, different types of uh, runoff events because the percolation into the soil isn't quite what it once was. So how that precipitation comes is really interesting, and that has lots of interesting applications. Great, thank you. I have uh, two questions sort of related to, to tree cover. Um, one, do the effects of summer fires and, and the loss of live tree cover have any real effect on the snowpack? Mm. Sure, that's a great question. So yeah, so um, you know, the kind of the, the snowpack modeling that we do, I mean, we use one particular snowpack model. There are many, many other ones out there. Um, most of them, um, use a a, um, a a land cover data set as one of the inputs. So it's important for us, it's important for the model to know when the snow is falling, what is it falling on? Is it falling on open grasses? Is it falling on conifers? Is it falling on other types of vegetation? Because that all affects how quickly it gets down to the ground. And all that. So land cover is an important input to snowpack models. And so it's sure, if you have a landscape that burns, um, now all of a sudden, the properties of that particular area are different in terms of interception and those kinds of things. And that's easy to adjust in the model. You can, you can adjust uh, the parameters that affect that. Uh, a, a sort of somewhat more interesting aspect to look at, and again, this is stepping outside of my area of expertise, I would point people towards um, Kelly Gleason, who is a professor at Portland State. And she does a lot of work in particular on snow, um, snowpack processes in uh, burned areas. And one of the interesting aspects there is the black carbon. So you have um, you know, all these burned trunks and then you start to have all this black carbon sort of flaking off. And when that gets blown onto the snow surface, it massively changes the albedo of the snow. And so now solar radiation is not being reflected off nearly as much and it's being absorbed into the snow. So that can totally change for sure how quickly snow or how long snow sticks around how quickly it melts off. So I, I don't, that's, there are other people that do research exactly on that topic uh, and I'm not one of them. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, what happens to snow if we meet the low emission scenarios of the Paris and Glasgow agreements? Sure, so I, I, that's a great question. Um, I have a version of this talk where I sort of show a sequence of results where you know I, I sort of showed you, okay, this is like what, the end of century temperature and precipitation and therefore snow is going to look like 
under the most pessimistic uh, scenario if you look at sort of the um, RCP 4.5 or the RCP 2.6. So these are other greenhouse gas emission scenarios, which as that number comes down, it's becoming essentially a more and more optimistic scenario in terms of being able to contain emissions. And as one would expect, the, the, the negative impacts that you see in terms of the reduction of precipitation as snow, those become less, right? It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not like a linear curve, but it, it, it is a sort of a monotonically increasing curve where if, you know, if, we, if we do a good job of, um, uh, of, of keeping emissions low, you know, the, the reduction in snow is going to be not that great. And then as we get worse and worse, it just it scales up, okay? So th those figures I showed you were kind of worst case scenario figures. Great. All right. I think our last question for tonight, uh, can you briefly outline the actual process uh, for how a backcountry user takes and then submits a snow depth measurement? That is, how can we help out? Sure. So um, the best thing to do is to actually go to the community snowobs.org website and you know if you kind of look at the boxes the choices across the top there's going to be like how to get involved or tutorial or things like that and um it really only all that you need is like a measuring device and you know people who are backcountry skiers already have one you know i don't know how well that shows up but this is like one of my avalanche probes right here which is a three meter measuring stick all right it's a great tool to have you don't have to have that though um, that picture I showed you of heifer hut where I was measuring snow with my kids, I, I, I forgot my avalanche probe at home like a terrible skier. <laughs> and so I just, got a, I just got a dowel, a wooden dowel, you know, and I just took a Sharpie and I measured off every five centimeters up to 80 centimeters. And that was enough depth for me. And so I measured snow all the way up to heifer hut. Okay, so you don't need an expensive tool to do this, but you need something to measure the snow with. Next thing you need is you have to have your phone with you, all right? And this is important because these measurements, we need to know when they occur and we need to know where they occur accurately. And so when you take your phone with you when you're out in the snow, okay, even if you don't have cell service, your phone has a GPS in it and it knows where you are, okay? As creepy as that sounds, it knows where you are, okay? So you can use the Mountain Hub app Okay, and you get that downloaded on your phone. And so you're out in the field, you assemble your avalanche probe or you take your wooden stick, you measure the snow, all right? You get a 70 centimeters, what do you know? You pull out your phone, you open the app, and there's a sequence of steps that you go through in terms of logging that 70 centimeter or whatever it is, depth, okay? And that's all there is to it. Your data will show up on our website the very next day, okay? Which is really cool. We have all of this stuff totally automated. Um, and again, if you don't have cell service when you're out in the field, that's okay. You enter the information on your phone and your phone hangs onto it. And then as soon as you get back into cell service, your phone will push that information up to the app and we, and we get it the next day. Okay, so we, we intentionally kept this citizen science project as simple as possible to sort of make it as easy as possible for anyone to participate. All right, anybody can measure the snow. I'm pretty sure mo most everybody these days has a phone on them. Um, some may not. And if you are in a situation where you don't, I will say you can use a desktop computer to enter this information. It's just a lot less convenient. It really is. Great. Okay. Well, hopefully, so, hope that helps. Hopefully you'll get some more uh, data points here from the Metha Valley then. Uh, thank you so much. This is a great presentation. We all learned a lot. Uh, for those of you listening in, if you enjoyed tonight's First Tuesday presentation and are looking for more snow stories, um, we hope you'll join us for our February First Tuesday presentation, which will feature Lowell Skoog, who recently released his book called Written in the Snows Across Time on Skis in the Pacific Northwest. Um, you can email us at events at methowconservancy.org to make sure you get that Zoom link in early February. It should be a great one. Thank you again, Professor Hill, for sharing your awesome information and um, great ways for us to get involved and, and maybe add some knowledge to this knowledge bank that's ever growing. And thank you all for joining us tonight.